Welcome to the briefing this afternoon on the 2013 Solar Industry Job Census. Uh, this is the afternoon when we are very uh, excited that we're going to be able to hear the results of this important job census to find out what is what the latest information is uh, uh, both across the country as well as finding out some state-specific information as well about this very, very important burgeoning new area that we've, in which we've seen tremendous growth over the last decade. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And this briefing is part of a whole series of briefings that we will be holding throughout the year in terms of looking at technology, science, and policy issues before the Congress. And so, as I said, we are very, very uh, thrilled to be releasing uh, information with regard to this important report. We did just receive word that Congresswoman Anna Eshoo will not be able to join us, uh, that there were some folks that um, uh, had just arrived with whom she had to meet and will not therefore be able to make it down in time uh, to speak at the briefing this afternoon. Which, which is a shame because she is someone who has really embraced the need for this country to move forward on a clean energy economy. She has been a voice for innovation, addressing competitiveness, and of course coming from the Silicon Valley area knows all too well how important uh, technology development and innovation are in terms of really driving an economy forward. So let's get to it in terms of finding out what is going on with regard to jobs in the solar industry. What are we learning? Where are things? Um, and so to start us off with this, uh, the findings of this new report is Andrea Luecki, who is the President and Executive Director of the Solar Foundation. Andrea. Thank you, Carol. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, we just released three new reports this morning and numbers for all 50 states. And unfortunately, our website is a little bit crashed out because of the high volume, but you can check out all that information on solarstates.org. But I'm here today just to talk about solar jobs in general. We have, over the last four years, uh, tracked industry growth in terms of employment. I'm not sure how this is okay. Okay, well, let me just give you a few words about who we are. We are a national C3 nonprofit. We are focused on increasing understanding of solar energy through strate strategic research that educates the public and helps to inform. Um, and transform markets. We are headquartered in D.C., but as I said, we are national. And um, just to be clear, we are not an industry-funded group. Okay. So over the last four years, we've put out the National Solar Job Census report. In 2010, it w we released our seminal baseline report, which found over 93,000 solar workers across the country. Based on the success of that report, we rolled out updates in 2011, 2012, and then another very comprehensive baseline effort again in 2013. We just released this last report two weeks ago, and it was very wi widely uh, received, very well received, and it was in partnership with the BW Research Partnership, which is a labor market research firm, and the GW Solar Institute. So we, through our data collection effort, we made nearly 74,000 phone calls and sent almost 11,000 emails to thousands of, upon thousands of companies. We collected hundreds of thousands of data, of data points from companies. We found 18,000 establishment locations. That's up from 15,000 in the year before. Our methodology is highly rigorous. 
it, it's survey based. It, it's modeled after the Bureau of Labor Statistics methodology. And our margin of error is plus or minus 1.3%, which is significantly lower than any industry studies of, of, of its kind. Our definition of a solar worker is somebody who spends at least 50% of their time working on solar activities. But what we found is that nearly 91% of people work 100% of their time in solar. So our definition of a solar worker is as, you know, 50%. Some, some may say we are, you know, overcounting, right? But we find that this metric is, is a very reasonable proxy, considering that 91% work at least 100% of their time in solar. So we're tracking employment by industry sector. We're looking at PV, concentrating solar power, solar heating and cooling. We're looking at jobs all the way up and down the supply chain in installation, manufacturing, sales and distribution, project development, and other, which represents jobs in research and development, people in academia, people that work for nonprofits like myself. And we asked many questions. We were on the phone with these people for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, and we had 30, 35 questions that we asked them, obviously. You know, how many jobs do you currently have? How many jobs do you expect to have over the next 12 months? How, how, what percentage of your revenues are, are attributable to solar? How much do you pay your, way, your, your workers? What are the average wages? What skills are required? What education background is required? What are your perceptions of, of policy? Um, what are your barriers to growth? And you know, tell us a little bit about, about your workers. What, what is the demographic makeup of your workforce? We did an oversample in California, Minnesota, and Arizona this year. And those are the three reports that I mentioned that we just released this morning. So we did a deep dive oversampling in those three states. So what we recently found is that there are over 142,000 solar workers across the country at 18,000 locations, and that these are very good jobs. These are high paying jobs, high skilled jobs, and, and jobs that are highly sought after. In 2010, as I mentioned, there were 93,000 solar workers, and now there's nearly 143,000. This represents a growth of 53%, or nearly 50,000 new jobs over the course of three years. So not a lot of industries can really tout that kind of success. As you can see, coal mining, um, uh, still smaller than the solar industry, and they grew only by 0.25%. And fossil fuel electric generation shed workers, they shed about 8,000 workers during the si same time period. We created 24,000 workers, they lost 8,000 workers. So the solar industry is a strong and a quickly growing employer of American workers. So what are some of these drivers to this growth? Um, obviously, cost reductions are probably the most prominent, most important driver. Over the last several years, we've seen huge drops in component prices and, and the cost of installed capacity. It's gone from $6 a watt to approximately $3 a watt in just three short years. That, coupled with increased awareness from consumers, increased adoption by consumers because of these price drops, that's what's fueling a lot of this growth. Then, of course, in some places, in some cases, you have policies that are designed to accelerate both the drop in prices and the uptick of consumer adoption. So in our deep dive, we found that California is the number one solar state. It has about a third of all the workers across the country and 40% of all installed capacity. It's long been a leader. It's been an incubator of the industry for, for decades. So it's really not a, at all a surprise that California is number one with 47,000 solar workers. In the Bay Area, there's about 20,000 solar workers. In the Southern California area, there's 10,000. And in the Inland Empire, which is just to the east of LA, 
there's about 5,000 solar workers. So California added more jobs than any other state, added 3,500 jobs, and currently has 47,000. Workers in California earn more than workers across the country. They earn 63 cents more per hour than other solar workers in other states. And they're more optimistic about future growth, too. Nationally, solar employers expect to grow by about 15.6%, but in California, they're even more bullish, expecting to grow by about 22%. So it's all coming up roses in California, or at least that's what it would seem. Arizona is a little bit different. Despite having the number one solar resource in the nation, it had a tough year. It lost 1,200 jobs. There are a variety of reasons as to why. It's hard to, to, to say exactly why. Um, we think that it's largely due to the Solana plant in Gila Bend uh, recently being completed. But there are other factors as well. Um, but I think it's the growth rate, the anticipated growth rate that they're expecting next year that, that's really you know, the biggest signal. Employers are not bullish at all. They only anticipate growing by 5.6%. So there's a lot of uncertainty in Arizona right now in terms of their ability to, to, to grow. And, and, and it's a shame because Arizona has, as I said, the greatest solar resource in this country. Minnesota is an interesting case. A small solar market, it only has 858 jobs. It's, it's ranked 31st, but the potential is tremendous. Minnesota is mandated, there's a solar carve out, and it's mandated to uh, create or have 450 megawatts of solar by the end of the decade, by 2020. That's a 30-fold increase in installed capacity. And what we're finding is that while the industry is becoming more labor efficient, jobs are nearly directly correlated with an increase in installed capacity. And so when you see installations going up, and where you see installations going up, that's where you have jobs. So our map, which is uh, accessible at solarstates.org, um, hopefully you won't run into any technical problems there. Um, it gives a, like a baseball card profile snapshot of each state. Um, it's pretty fun to play with if you have a couple minutes, see where, where your state is at. Nearly 90% of the states grew. Only five states contracted and two states remained flat. So it's a really positive story nationwide. Not only did the U.S. solar industry nationally grow by 20%, which it, you know, outpaced the U.S. economy by tenfold, but you're just seeing so much growth across all states, or nearly all states. The five states that, that contracted are Arizona, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Oregon, and Alaska. And this heat map represents the top 10. Well, the, the little suns represent the top 10. And as you can see, our, our, um, our solar can be harnessed just about anywhere in the country. It's not constrained by geography, by solar resource, or by political lines or party lines. There are blue states and red states that, that have solar, most notably in terms of red states. There's Texas, Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia. These are hot solar markets, and they're not you know, they're, they're red states, and, and that's okay. I think that's very promising. So this is the list of our top 20. There were some ties. Uh, probably should have listed them a little bit different to represent the ties better. Um, and Washington is actually tied also with Maryland. This is a, an old version of my slide. 
But um, as you can see, with the asterisk, there are seven states that grew by 1,500 jobs or more. That's, that's very notable, I think. But Air, California is the big leader. It has five times more jobs than Arizona, number two. This slide shows how the states have changed in terms of rank. And among the leaders, there, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of movement. The, four, the top four states remain the same in, from, from last year to this year. So California, Arizona, New Jersey, and, and Massachusetts didn't shift or change. But you know, as you can see, there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of shifting, a lot of moving. Everyone's trying to position themselves as a leader. And, and it's, it's a very dynamic time for our industry. North Carolina, in terms of growth rate of our top 10 states, had the, had the greatest or, or, or largest growth rate at 121%, more than doubled. This is largely due to all the utility scale installations that are happening or, or started happening since late 2012. In 2013, they're expecting uh, a 138% increase in utility scale installations. And North Carolina is going to be the third, is going to be ranked third in terms of utility scale installations in 2013. So that's a state to watch. So 20 states more than doubled their solar growth. 18 of them were in the south in the Midwest or in the mountain region. Wyoming had the greatest growth or the highest growth at 580%. Um, you know, these growth rates are astronomical. You just see, you know, 400%, 300%. You know, you're thinking, how is that possible? But you have to, you have to really look at the fact that these states are coming or growing from a smaller base. California, you know, by contrast, California had an 8% growth rate, and it created 3,500 jobs. Wyoming had a 580% growth rate and created 290 jobs. So there's a huge difference. So when you look at growth rates, I think you really need to, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, really, it's about actual numbers of jobs that were created. And this just shows the breakdown of jobs by sector. On the far top left is the national picture. About half are in installation, 21% are in manufacturing. In New Jersey, three quarters are in installation. In Arizona, about 40% are in installation. There is a treasure trove of data on our website and in our reports, so I do encourage you to, to take a peek. And if you have any questions, of course, um, I'm happy to, to try and answer them. Thank you. So for another perspective with regard to the solar census, uh, we'll turn to our next speaker, who is Amit Ronan. Uh, Amit is the director of the GW Solar Institute uh, and is a professor at the George Washington University Trachtenberg School of Public Policy. And of course, he also brings many years of experience uh, up here on the Hill uh, where he worked over on the Senate side for Senator Maria Cantwell for a number of years. And so another office who that was really, really leading with regard to looking at technology. Amit? Thanks, Carol. Thanks so much for hosting us today. As uh, Carol mentioned, I'm Amit Ronin from GW Solar Institute at George Washington University. And pleased uh, and excited to be partnering with the Solar Foundation on the census this year. Uh, we are going to be, my uh, presentation focused on some of the policy questions and, and interesting findings that we come out of the census. and. I'd like to start with two charts. So even though there's about a snowstorm coming outside, no one's really thinking of solar right now. 
Here are two charts to show you what's going on. This is the first one. And you don't even have to worry about you know, what those numbers say specifically, but it's really about that arrow. And it's the cost of panels and the declining cost has really been a huge market driver and translates to a lot of the findings that we're seeing in the census. So specifically in the last five years, the cost of solar panels has declined 80% since 2008, which has led fundamentally to a market transformation on the affordability and of these panels. And if we had that, this one goes back to 2001, if we went back to 1976, solar costs are down 99%. So it's a very different era from when solar was tried in the 70s under notably uh, President Carter who was pushing solar. You know, some people are still in that mindset in terms of solar potential, but it's a world of difference in what's out there. And in the future, those costs are expected to decline. Uh, the uh, Department of Energy under the SunShot Initiative, which Jason should tell us more about, they have a goal by 2020 of making solar a dollar a watt, and that is considered commercially competitive. Solar is competitive in some markets now but that will be uh, on an equal footing with all different solar technologies. So that's chart number one. The other chart goes the other way. And we're seeing incredible growth in, in uh, the solar industry uh, during our census time period, that, the snapshot that we took in 2013. Uh, capacity jumped quite a bit. We're almost at 13 uh, gigawatts of capacity now. Uh, when we have the data, we'll be able to add one more bar there, and you'll see those green cup boxes there are going to grow quite a bit, and that's concentrating solar power. So that's utility-scale solar, where typically you see that as mirrors or arrays in the deserts. And there are a bunch of very large projects coming online, to almost uh, all in the desert southwest. And those are uh, multi-billion dollar projects, hundreds of uh, megawatts capacity, and a lot of people are are very enthusiastic to see how that plays with the larger grid. And you'll see that that far too uh, will continue. And last year was actually the first year that so there was more solar installed than wind capacity in our country. Granted, it was a bad year for wind because of some uh, underlying tax policies, but it's a remarkable growth in the, in the solar industry. And of course, as a academic, we always have to have, on the other hand, on the other hand in this case is that we're we're going from a very small base. Uh, solar is still only half a percent, roughly, of the U.S. electricity mix and demand, um, but it has potential to grow. So the first uh, primary fi finding that we see that's sort of embedded in all, everything in the census is that the jobs are falling where the installation is. So that's an important trend because uh, maybe it's self-evident, but if you think deeper into it, uh, sometimes there's manufacturing one center of our economy, uh, but the job, so where the jobs are, but the, um, the capacity and everything else is in other places. But here there's a very, very close correlation. So if you think about solar is not even being, been able to outsource abroad in terms of some of these jobs, here even the jobs themselves, the installation jobs are, are very local jobs. So the people who are putting in the installation, they're the ones who are getting the jobs and Case in point, of course, is California, as Andrea mentioned a couple times. This is a chart from last year, 43,000 jobs. Now with the new job numbers, we know that solar jobs grew 8% in California, 3,500 new jobs. And, uh, and we see that in the, in the other states, too. So it's not also in the other states. You might have noticed it's not necessarily where the solar uh, potential is. You know, New Jersey, Massachusetts, the top, top uh, states. They're not the sunniest states around, but they have the policies and the underlying um, support for, for the installations, and they're benefiting from the jobs. The other, hand, the other hand in this case is that California, this is, they were ranked number three. Now they're ranked fifth per capita. You have to remember California, of course, is a huge market in its own right, always ranked as, you know, above a lot of European countries in terms of its size. So, of course, they're going to have a lot of jobs. Vermont now has the distinction of being the number one state per capita for solar jobs. And another interesting thing, a uh, side note on California, is uh, they have 145,000 systems installed, so a lot of rooftops. Their, their next highest state is Arizona now, with their ranked number two. 
they actually only have 21,000 uh, uh, systems installed on their, their state, but only they have a third of the capacity of California. So a lot of numbers to show that basically, again, that if you're doing uh, installation and rooftop installation, so small scale, you're gonna, you get a lot more jobs out of that than even the utility scale uh, power structures. Okay, so another finding we found, so we added some uh, more interesting policy questions this year to try and figure out, well, what's the go, no-go decision that consumers are making when it comes to going solar? Why, where, where is this coming from? And we found that uh, if you look, basically, you can aggregate the first two uh, bars there, that overwhelmingly people are going for solar because they want to save money. And that correlates to the, the first two charts. Solar costs have declined dramatically. It's become affordable in a lot of cases. Um, a lot of that has to also do with uh, new financing options uh, pioneered by people like Sun Edison that we'll hear from in a minute that allow people to uh, say solar leasing is one popular option. You can put solar on your roof now, no money down, and all you have to do is pay less on your electricity bill every month. So for a lot of people, that's a no-brainer. Why wouldn't I go solar? That's a great deal from a, a lot of things. But we were surprised, and the numbers here are actually 85% in California. So you think of California as being, oh, they're doing it because they're green and they like, they want to, they're worried about climate change. California, the numbers are even stronger. And some of the other benefits that you typically associate with solar, of course, they're still there, but they're not the primary driver for consumers picking it up. So that could be stuff like, well, you see it up there, pollution reduction, uh, because my neighbor has one, I want to get one. Uh, in our region, you know, the power goes out a lot. Maybe you want your backup power. Um, that's not, not a big driver. And it may, it may also show a trend which uh, we're picking up, which is that, so solar was, was being built in the earlier years, in previous years, you get the earlier adopters who are willing to pay a premium because they get those other environmental benefits, for example. They're very passionate about the environment. But now we're reaching a new market segment where people are doing it because the economics are there. And that correlates uh, somewhat to this, this interesting finding. We asked, well, how, how do you think your customers, because again, we surveyed all of these thousands and thousands of solar businesses, how are your customers figuring out where information about solar? So maybe this is a, Part of the digital age, but that people are doing internet searches is a big part of it, or word of mouth. But if you look at the numbers, I think the interesting th thing there is that people are, they're the ones seeking solar information. So your traditional sources of when you're trying to sell a business, whether it's media or advertising, that's really, in terms of the solar industry's perspective, a small part of it. People are, are enthusiastic about solar. We see that uh, 90 plus percent of people in America when in uh, a recent poll are enthusiastic about solar, but right now only about 1% of people have them. We asked a related question, which we don't have a chart about, but is, uh, has, some, has some interesting results. And we asked, well, do you think that, the, that uh, your local utility company and your friends and neighbors understand the benefits of solar? And only about half of the people responded, said they thought that. And when it came to their member of Congress, only two thirds of people thought that their member of Congress did not understand the benefit of solar. All right, so uh, that's sort of part of the more detailed findings of the census. We're gonna, I was gonna uh, quickly highlight some of the uh, overarching trends that we see going on in, this, in the solar industry because they're uh, gonna have a big effect on you know, what next year's census is gonna show and the year after that. So on the sunny side of things, what is, what's the good news stories here? Well, we know that solar employment, probably just based on the increasingly affordability, that there's a lot of market to expand, that the solar employment's gonna keep growing. We see double digit growth rates for at least the next decade. We see the solar employers themselves, as Andrea mentioned, over 15% 15, 15 growth rate. That's their estimation of what's gonna happen in 2014, and that's another 24,000 jobs. I just mentioned uh, the 90% plus approval rating in terms of enthusiasm for solar. Then we have a lot of uh, market priming going on uh, that's going to underlie future growth from our government and, and major businesses. So 
uh, this administration has been enthusiastic about solar energy and incorporating renewables. We have the Interior Department since 2009 has approved 25 utility scale facilities. We have our largest electricity user in the world, the U.S. military. They're committed to picking up three gigawatts of solar by 2025. That's an important market. And then last December, President Obama signed a executive order that's requiring the federal government to get 20% of its uh, demand from renewables by 2020. And then the second part of that is business. It's not just government uh, supported things. The top 25 corporate solar users, so these are people who have already, they're a little bit ahead of the curve, perhaps, uh, seeing the benefits of solar. They're actually going, going all in. They're increasing their capacity 50%. That's what they did in this past year. So people like Walmart, who is actually the largest solar installer in the country, they're, they have 215 installations. IKEA has solar on 89% of their buildings. We have uh, Kohl's Department Store is another enthusiastic solar provider, and the economics make sense for them. So the stat there is over 50 million Americans live within 20 miles of a solar-powered Kohl's Department Store. And then uh, finally, the other important trend to note here is that we're actually far behind other countries in terms of installation. The U.S. is now the number three solar market behind Japan and China and we only have about 13% of the world market. Uh, other nations are making just massive uh, investments and commitments to going solar. We got China. They're planning 40 gigawatts of solar by 2015. So just in a few years time, I remember I mentioned we only have 13 gigawatts here. They're gonna put in 40 in a few years. We have places even like oil rich Saudi Arabia. They said they're gonna do 16 gigawatts of solar in the next 20 years. So they're, they're basically going from zero. So why does a place like Saudi, Saudi Arabia, they're sitting on a, a sea of oil, a sea of gas, why would they go solar? Well, first they have really good solar resources. It's hot and dry over there. But also they know that solar is gonna be one of the largest uh, growth industries in the 21st century. They need jobs for a, for a big population, uh, young population that they have there. And they also know that they, if they produce solar at home, that's more oil and gas they can sell to other countries that aren't quite ahead there, so they'll, they'll make it. And I saw recently Sun Edison's even looking at Saudi Arabia and uh, manufacturing there. Maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that from Bob. But that is, that is opportunity, not just for those countries that are making those investments, but also for, perhaps for our American manufacturers. So that's the sunny side of things. There's also cloudy. Not everything is... Uh, well and good because, and these are some of the dynamics that we see that will affect what the future job potential and growth rates are here. So one of the big ones you may have heard about from your states, uh, depending on where you are, but there's a growing battles between utilities and solar, distributed solar in particular, and we're, those are likely to continue. Um, Andrea mentioned it in the context of Arizona, that that might have been part of the pullback there. Um, we have seen, in, for example, in Arizona, the Arizona Public Service, which is the largest utility, they spent $9 million in essentially anti-solar ads, anti-distributed solar ads, trying to influence regulators and the public there that distributed generation didn't make sense. Uh, we saw, on the other hand, of course, is that the solar industry was hitting back and saying, why are you taking away consumer choice. We're seeing interesting dynamics in places like Georgia where uh, Tea Party, Green Tea Party they call it, so there's Tea Party uh, people and environmentalists are getting together to promote solar for different reasons but with a common shared goal and that is having an uh, impact on, on public opinion. So that's one of the uh, big things that we're watching closely because it's in playing out increasingly. It sort of correlates pretty strongly with wherever you have higher penetration rates that's where there's pushback from some of the incumbent suppliers right now. Uh, another key factor here that's, that is much of it is in uh, Congress's bailiwick is the public policies and incentives that re, uh, underlie a lot of the uh, business models right now and there's a lot of uncertainty around that. So on the federal level, we had the eight-year ITC, the investment tax credit, that's essentially 30% of any federal, any project 
whether it's small or big, is paid for by uh, the federal government. That was passed in October of 2008, so it expired. It was an eight-year policy, allowed a lot of these investments to go forward, both in new companies. You know, there's pretty strong correlation between the drop in PV price, this, but a lot of the uh, big concentrating solar projects that take years to build, they need to get billions of dollars in capital from financial markets. They're no longer able to do that because their project is going to take a couple of years to build and the, and the banks are saying, well, we don't know if Congress will extend the ITC after 2016. So that's a big one for the industry. And you know what happens next here in Congress, whether it's on, people are talking about it through tax extenders, through when tax reform comes along, is probably the single most uh, important factor in solar's future. And then uh, another thing I wanted to mention, if uh, you weren't following this closely, that, that there's a pretty major solar trade war going on. And it is a bit of battle here in the US. The industry is split between the manufacturers of solar panels and the people who install them. There are hybrid people uh, that do both. But essentially, that there was a complaint by a major manufacturer here in the US uh, that the Chinese were dumping cheap solar panels onto our markets, which uh, we're doing that in an uncompetitive way. So tariffs were put on that. There were countervailing tariffs by, uh, put on by China. But without getting into all the, the mucky details, that is creating a lot of people who want to move forward on projects. This is something that, that creates churn and uncertainty and probably a negative drag on, on growth. We did ask this specific question in the, in the census um, whether they thought basically that affordable or cheap solar panels from China were a benefit or a harm to their business and I guess no surprise but the results were largely split um, about 56 percent of project developers so the people who use those cheap s solar panels when they put them on people's roofs or in larger arrays they like that and about a quarter of the surveyed companies said that the Chinese cheap chi Chinese panels were a bad thing for them for their industries. And uh, finally, I wanted to mention that, you know, wh wh since we are looking forward and trends and what's going to happen in the next couple of years, that you always have to take this in consideration what are the, the uh, competitors to solar. And of course, now we have an abundance of cheap natural gas that's really been a paradigm shift in the industry, energy industry. Right now, that's taking mostly the brunt out of coal, is uh, being hurt most by cheap natural gas, but that's something you look at. And also, Congress could play a big role in that if they, they start incorporating some of the externalities associated with solar's competitors, namely uh, its contribution to climate change and whether there's increased spill regulations or what have you given some of the, the recent uh, oil train spills or the uh, coal mining related spill in West Virginia and that sort of thing. So that's what we, uh, we're looking at, and uh, thank you for having us. Great, and here's Carol. So now we're going to turn to someone who is doing this every day. And to hear a little bit about the business perspective with regard to what's going on in his industry, we are very, very glad to be joined by Bob Powell, who is the president of Sun Edison North America. Well, great. Thank you uh, very much for that. And if I could just make one slight change when you're introducing me, I actually think that we're all doing it here. It just happens to be in different areas. And, uh, and, I, and I know you understand that spirit totally. Um, but yes, I offer a perspective that is definitely on the ground in terms of building projects in the field every day. And so Sun Edison, as being one of the originators in the US of the solar business, which started in the distributed generation part of the business, is, uh, is one that I, I think we've seen an awful lot in the solar industry. So many of the trends we see up here, I think about, it's very pragmatic on a daily basis. 
I'll walk you through a little bit about Sun Edison and maybe an intersection with public policy and innovation as well. But it's pretty clear to me that as I have been at Sun Edison, before that actually was part of NRG having sold uh, a solar company that I ran to NRG, and then in a utility, Pacific Gas and Electric Company, which is based in San Francisco. I've seen a lot of different perspectives on this, but solar has been incredibly impactful on our economy. I live in California now, obviously very big in California, but many other parts of the US here and certainly globally as well. So when you see trends like the installed cost of solar, when I started was at seven and eight dollars per unit per watt, all the way down to two and below two dollars a watt, there's something that went on there. And I think a lot of it was about innovation and I actually think that public policy had a huge impact on that. Without local incentives, without federal help via the ITC, accelerated depreciation and other forms of help, we would not have gotten to the point where we are now. And that is, we've put an awful lot of solar in the ground and we've gotten more and more competitive with the help of public officials from a policy perspective. So that's really exciting and I hope we continue to see that partnership. So just a couple of uh, thoughts about Sun Edison and how it intersects with this. We're actually a reasonably old company, right? Um, about 55 years old. We're a publicly listed company. And uh, so we have 6,000 employees in 25 global locations. We actually have 2,000 of those employees here in the US, 600 of which are only focused on solar, my part of the business. We do business in six continents. We have a pretty large number, 1.1 gigawatts of solar interconnected worldwide. It's an awful lot of solar. And then we have a very large pipeline of projects, uh, over three gigawatt pipeline. Now, I'll give you a few more facts about Sun Edison as we go through, but I don't want it to be an advertisement, but not just us, but Solar in general, our industry is very ubiquitous. We don't just play with utilities. We also are very present in your local communities as well, not just at the utility level, but in the homes, very small systems, commercial, industrial customers, government agencies, municipalities throughout this country. Now, with our installed base, we have actually installed projects in 20 of our 50 states. It's a pretty broad coverage. And last year, from a job perspective, in, in the US or North America, we actually did about 200 megawatts. And so if you use, some people estimate between 15 to 30 people per job, 200 megawatts, pretty simple math that tells you how many jobs in addition to the Sun Edison employees we have. It's an awful lot. And what's interesting, and I would concur with the comments about the jobs we create in solar, those are not easily outsourceable jobs. We're talking about construction workers, engineers, a lot of people in our local communities, permitting agencies, landowners, et cetera, who all benefit from solar projects, both big and small. So there's a lot of job creation there, and we're very proud about it. Um, so with the different businesses that we have here, at least in terms of our philosophy, um, I think Amit made a comment about utilities fighting distributed generation. I actually think that there's a different way to engage with the communities, and the utilities being one of those. We actually think that we should be working together with utilities to embrace perhaps energy efficiency programs coupled with distributed generation. And we're seeing a lot of great partnerships coming there. So one of the things we need to think about is how do we work together in our communities and with the businesses? And for me, very pragmatically, it's just really simple. If I work with a utility, I'm probably going to be much more successful on a long-term basis because utilities have been around for a long, long time and they understand very well the regulatory processes 
And so we see our view of solar as working together with our communities and participants in the marketplace. So what I have here is our set of offices. And we actually, in Sun Edison, do upstream manufacturing, some in the US, some of the other parts of the globe as well. So we start with the raw materials, the polysilicon. We don't do everything. We have to outsource some components of this. But ultimately, it gets us back to some manufacturing in the US, is across the country, and as I said, projects in 20 of our US states with California and Arizona certainly being the largest ones. Massachusetts is huge. New York, I would say, um, commensurate with what we saw before, is a huge upcoming state. My home state of Georgia, very interestingly enough, I'm very excited about many projects going on there as well. So our worldwide pipeline is very US focused by far the largest proportion of our pipeline, which is really projects that we have some good visibility into. We may not have all the agreements signed, but we think we have a good sense that we're going to have a project. 44% of our pipeline is in the US. And yes, there are a lot of other parts of the globe. Um, I am excited about the announcement we made about working with uh, the kingdom in Saudi Arabia and a really great joint venture relationship there. And I think Amit was exactly right. For the kingdom, it's very much about a couple of things. But one thing is clear. It's about jobs as well. And they realize that solar can be very impactful in their community uh, with jobs, in addition to preservation, the economic value of that petroleum resource they have in there. And then our backlog, which is more near term. But let me I'll give you sort of a ground level view of how I think about this in innovation. Um, First off, without public policy and different incentives across the globe, I would never have been able to assemble or build the projects that I've had, that I've built in the past, or these that I have here. And when I have such a large pipeline like this, it really forces me to get better. And so as a uh, business, someone who runs a large component of a business, Public policy enabling me to get to the point where I can have a large business like this has really forced me and the rest of the participants in this business to get better and better, again, resulting in much lower cost, which I think with the right support we can continue to do and continue to build a great solar industry that competes with any form of energy generation. So finally, from a policy perspective, there are a few things that are really important to us and that we would perhaps like to see. As we know, the ITC, the 30% ITC, is reducing to a 10% level in 2016, at least programmatically. Um, there are a few things that could be very helpful and very helpful to jobs in the solar marketplace. One, we'd like to see um, the commenced construction rules on, uh, via the extenders bill to deploy more solar allowed. And effectively, what that allows us to do is take projects we start in 2016 and continue to enjoy the benefits of the ITC. I think we'd like to see some form of ITC or a product, uh, production tax credit as an option in the future. That would be excellent and would allow us to continue the growth in solar. I think there's some other things as well, um, like public-private partnerships with ourselves, the armed forces, and the federal government in general being the largest energy user is a great area and encouraging more solar uh, via um, renewable energy goals is great. In fact, I'm flying from cold DC here down to Arizona to do a ribbon cutting in Tucson for the davis Monthan Air Force Base solar project that we helped build. So I'm very excited about that. So that partnership I think can be really great with us in the industry. And so certainly, um, uh, working on free trade and import tariffs, that could be a huge deal killer for us as well. And on the state side, there are a lot of policies that really help us. In California, the California Solar Initiative was one of the original ones. It was very impactful. The renewable portfolio standards that the utilities in the state of California uh, were required to uh, implement was very helpful. And I would actually say that public policy 
particularly on the state level, what's interesting is, as I've watched solar go across the U.S., it's actually been a bit of an incubator for innovative thoughts in terms of how you encourage via public policy investment. There have been a lot of different systems tried in the states. California, you collect from the utility customers for smaller projects, and then you fund solar projects directly. Other markets have these renewable energy credits or RECs that you can trade. And a lot of other different interesting uh, ideas that states have had and have tried. And so I actually think that part of what solar has done is help public policymakers think of different ways to encourage investment. And it's really worked. We've seen great markets. Massachusetts has a very interesting marketplace as well. Uh, New York is up and burgeoning. I think New Jersey had an interesting one that had some hiccups, but was really a good way for other states to think about how to craft their public policies. So in short, solar is a big job creator, and our partnership with public officials via the public policies has been very impactful. I would like to see it continue because I think this is a great industry that means an awful lot to us. And so with that, I think I'll uh, end my discussion and uh, we'll get another perspective here. Thank you. And before we open it up for our discussion, we're going to hear from Jason, Jason Walsh, who is Senior Advisor to the Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Because the Department of Energy has uh, made uh, uh, a lot of difference in terms of policy over the years and in terms of the investments in R&D and uh, in terms of research development and deployment. And to hear a little bit more about those goals and how that's transpired, we welcome Jason. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I want to thank Carol and the EESI team for inviting me to speak, and it's a pleasure to be here today and to join my illustrious co-panelists. Um, I'm going to focus my remarks on, uh, as Carol suggested, DOE's role uh, it, with our many partners in developing this industry, and in particular what we are focused on now uh, with respect to our uh, SunShot initiative uh, and attempts to drive down the cost of, of solar deployment. I do think it's worth taking a step back to note just how far solar has come uh, in the last few decades uh, and how that ha process has sort of broken through the sound barrier uh, over the last uh, several years. Amit covered much of this in his slides, so I'm just going to simply underline for emphasis. Um, but the numbers are, are, are rather startling. Rooftop solar panels today cost roughly 1% of, of what they did 35 years ago uh, when DOE first uh, started investing in solar R&D. And the prices have dropped more than three quarters uh, since 2008. Uh, since 2008, total U.S. solar PV deployment has jumped by a factor of 13, right? uh, passing the 10 gigawatt milestone. Uh, last year, and uh, as Amit mentioned, it's, we're already approaching 13 gigawatts uh, this year. So the, the chart is, is in a sense, a, a, a combination of two charts that Amit showed you, uh, showing costs going down, 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 and deployment going up, 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 uh, and it's a fairly straightforward story, and a good one. Um, I do think it's important to emphasize that this kind of dramatic cost reduction did not emerge from a vacuum. Right? Uh, Bob mentioned the importance of public policy. Uh, couldn't agree with him more. Uh, there are a number of other factors uh, at play as well. One of those has been the collaboration between DOE, our national labs, and private industry uh, over the last three plus decades. Uh, a few years back, we commissioned a third party evaluation of the impacts of ERE's investments in solar R&D from the inception of DOE uh, in the mid-1970s to 2008, actually right before the takeoff of solar deployment, which estimated conservatively that EERE's roughly $3.7 billion total investment over that time period yielded a net economic benefit uh, of about $15 billion. Now, if that, if that analysis were taken into 2013, uh, I suspect the ROI number would be significantly higher. 
Um, a part of this analysis was building a counterfactual of what cost and reliability curves for solar modules would have looked like in the absence of DOE support. Um, the, you probably can't see these particular figures, which is not all that helpful, but the, the, the analysis essentially, the bottom line of it is that it estimated, the counterfactual estimated that uh, EERE's investments in solar R&D accelerated the industry by roughly 12 years, right? uh, which is essentially the difference between an industry that is cost competitive today and an industry that, that would not have been cost competitive today uh, in the absence of that support. Um, it, it, I, I think those kind of numbers can get a little abstracted, so I think it's at times important to put a face and a name on, on what some of this looks like. Um, in the 1990s, DOE's National Renewable Energy Lab worked with an early partner, uh, Solar Cells Incorporated, uh, proving a, a thin film cost structure that gave rise to more than a dozen startups uh, that, that were designing and manufacturing thin film uh, PV modules. One of those startups uh, uh, was called First Solar. Uh, as some of you probably know, it's now a global leader in PV manufacturing based in Ohio. Uh, together, EERE, NREL, uh, and First Solar developed a unique process for manufacturing high efficiency thin film cadmium telluride um, uh, cells, uh, which was a process that, that won a 2003 R&D 100 award and really considered in many ways a significant milestone uh, in the development of solar technology uh, and, and in driving down costs. Jump ahead to 2012 when First Solar installed its 10 millionth PV module uh, in the uh, Desert Sunlight Solar Farm Project in California, which when it's completed in 2015 will be one of the two largest solar projects, uh, in PV projects in the world. All right. So uh, th these are numbers, but they're also uh, the, the individual companies and, and a whole lot of workers. Right. Um, I, I work for EERE, uh, uh, but I would remiss if I didn't mention that just as we play uh, an instrumental role in technology development as DOE, we also play a crucial role in financing. Right. And this is particularly true in the utility scale market. So as you see on this slide, the utility scale market had zero projects. If you go to the left of, of, uh, uh, of that graph just a few years ago, then five projects, all of which were supported by DOE's loan program office with loan guarantees. And now we are up to uh, 15 projects. Uh, amounting to roughly two and a half gigawatts of installed capacity in the pipeline uh, or, or just being commissioned uh, uh, as we speak. Uh, and as you can see, all the most recent projects have been privately financed, right? And so the, 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 I think the bottom line takeaway here is that loan guarantees from DOE made those first five projects bankable and proved the financial viability of these projects to utilities and investors, which is really a central role that DOE plays. We reduce risk for the private sector on both the technology side uh, and then on the financing side uh, as well. Um, so now we're in 2014, uh, which I think will be in, in some ways considered the, the breakout year uh, for concentrating solar power. Um, you can see the basic stats here for three of the loan program office supported CSP projects. Uh, Ivan Pa just came online, and in fact, the ribbon cutting is going to be later this week uh, out uh, in California. Uh, one of the most important things about this technology, uh, as I think many of you know, is that it is dispatchable baseload power. It can keep providing electricity, peak load, uh, and even for hours after the sun goes down. Uh, it's worth noting that all of the technologies that are central to CSP, thermal energy storage, uh, parabolic troughs, uh, power towers, dish systems have been developed with extensive R&D support uh, from EERE over a number of years. Um, let me transition to talking about our SunShot initiative. It was launched in February 2011 as a national effort to make solar um, power cost competitive with conventional sources of electricity by 2020. Uh, may, uh, many of you may have heard and, and Amit mentioned uh, the SunShot target of a dollar a watt for, for utility scale solar by 2020. 
I, I think some people thought that goal was wildly ambitious uh, a few years ago when we began Sunshot. Uh, but three years into a 10-year initiative, the solar industry has achieved roughly 60% of that goal. Right? Um, now, having said that, the next 40% is going to be harder. Uh, if you look closely at this waterfall chart, you'll see that the, the lion's share of the progress has been in the reduction of module costs, which uh, is, is, that, is the blue bar there, blue colored bar. If you take a look at the gold-colored bar, uh, that's changed very little since 2008. And, and this, this represents what we call balance of system costs, sometimes known as soft costs, which uh, includes costs ranging from permitting and siting and labor to financing and inspection and maintenance. Soft costs are, are decreasing very slowly. All right. um, for those of you who, who um, really want to wonk out on soft costs, there are, are two reports uh, from our national labs, Lawrence Berkeley, uh, and again, NREL, uh, that really sort of pick apart uh, w w w the, the sort of the constituent parts of these different soft costs and, and, and make some very interesting comparisons across countries. One of the, the interesting data points you'll find uh, in the LBNL analysis is that the soft costs for installing a rooftop solar panel in the U.S. are about five times higher than they are in Germany. And, um, so this is where we are today. Uh, in, in 2010, soft costs accounted for up to 50 percent uh, of the price of a solar PV system, and in 2012, they were 64 percent of the total residential system price. Right? So th this is, in some ways, is increasingly we're feeling is the biggest obstacle we face in, in making the sunshot goal of a dollar a watt uh, for utility scale by 2020. Um, and you know, this obstacle takes various forms, but, but one of the primary forms, and therefore one of the inflection points for us, is uh, really a balkanized set of siting and permitting policies and interconnection standards and other rules for PVs that are different across different jurisdictions, right, from across different states, across different counties, uh, across different municipal jurisdictions. Um, so to our mind, that's really kind of a point of attack and where we're focusing a lot of our work right now. Um, through our rooftop solar challenge, we, we at this point have funded over 20 teams across, across the country, actually it's up to 30 now, because we've done a second award round uh, and these teams have focused on developing innovative ways to streamline and standardize and simplify permitting, zoning, m metering, and interconnection processes, right? all of which make installing rooftop solar PV uh, easier and faster and cheaper for businesses and for homeowners. Um, that adds up. Uh, based on our own metrics, we estimate that these teams uh, helped reduce permitting fees by more than 10% uh, and eliminated one week of wait time uh, from the process of going solar for nearly 50 million Americans uh, in the participating locations uh, since our, our rooftop solar awardees covered a pretty broad span of governments across the country, uh, which saved businesses and homeowners uh, from an estimated 800 years worth of red tape related roadblocks or to put a finer point on it, saved the equivalent of 10 human lifetimes. Right? So it adds up. Um, I want to I leave you with a vision of what, what solar can look like uh, in, in 2030. The, in this map probably is hard to read, but bottom line, we can continue to grow uh, this industry uh, from state to state across the nation. Our, sol our Sunshot 2030 vision estimates uh, the potential of an, of an installed capacity of over 300 gigawatts. Um, uh, meeting 14% of, of the nation's electrical demand. Uh, it, this is something we can get to. It, it is achievable, uh, and it's going to require uh, the right mix of uh, private sector uh, and uh, public sector uh, partnership and support and uh, investment. So uh, thank you, and we'll move to conversation. Okay, now you've got lots of facts about what's been going on in the solar industry, lots of interesting local information. Uh, let's open it up for your questions, comments, and if you could just identify yourself, please, when you ask. Okay, we'll start you. My name is Sebastian Harris. I'm with the German Foundation called the Secret Foundation. 
our foundation close to the German Social Democratic Party. Uh, Germany's been mentioned a few, a few times. We have had a, a success story in Germany with deployment, with a quarter of electricity coming from renewables. And uh, someone who comes from Germany, the, the country generally loves red tape, so this, this uh, problem with red tape is one that even the Germans could solve. So a, a place that's as market-oriented as the U.S. should be able to get there too on the red tape. Uh, we also don't have very much sun in Germany, uh, so although we're, we're, we're cloudy, uh, we do, we are kind of the California of, uh, of Europe on our deployment side. My question is on the, on the trade war question with China, specifically the Sun Edison, is uh, there's a lot of discussion about maybe, perhaps keeping manufacturing jobs, solar in the U.S., but to others in the space, that ship has failed. Uh, from a deployment perspective, what do you see as the best possible outcome to, to the trade settlement and negotiation? And uh, do you see a, a future for, for solar manufacturing, panel manufacturing in, in the U.S.? Well, I, I think it's a good question. And so what would be the best possible outcome? I, I think for the solar industry, it would be to step back and look at what happens when you create trade wars. Economic activity contracts. And I can tell you without a doubt, if you put a tax on the technology that I have to buy or produce in some cases, because you heard my story, I've got a lot of US jobs. Some of my manufacturing capacity is in Taiwan. Some maybe not as much in China. Um, so I can tell you, if I have a tax on my, uh, my products that is put on, I'm going to do less of it. And I, I think what happens is locally, the jobs that I talk to you about, there will be less of those available. Now, we don't know the magnitude of what might be proposed here, but to me the best outcome would be to step back and let's figure out how we can work through this and not get into a trade war. I don't know the answer to that, and there are others that are a lot smarter than I, perhaps on the panel or out here, but generally trade wars don't work very well. I can tell you, I will do less business. There will be less people I employ. As to manufacturing in the U.S., I, and that's a tough one. I, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a struggle because of labor cost and a variety of other things. Uh, there is some production in the U.S., and I don't know what the future uh, holds because many things have surprised us, right? So I live in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Some really interesting companies that have come up thought about very different ways of manufacturing, thinking about technology. And so perhaps there are, because the U.S. is a very innovative uh, country, perhaps there is an angle there to more jobs as well. But I don't have the total picture on that. Uh, there's not a lot I'll add to that very good answer. I, I, I will mention on the manufacturing side, I mean, it's our belief that uh, there is still quite a bit of opportunity for U.S.-based manufacturers to capture market share in, in what is, after all, uh, a rapidly expanding market. I mean, just as one example, the supply chain for uh, the Solana CSP power plant, which was one of the, the power plants I showed on, on that slide, had a supply chain that extended across over 35 states. Right? So it, it's there and it's possible. We, we've done some analysis, actually, of the cost factors that uh, different manufacturers uh, assess and calculate as they're making location decisions. Um, labor costs are, are a factor, and, 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 and this was explicitly a comparison of, of China-based manufacturing to U.S.-based manufacturing. Um, labor costs were a factor, but a relatively small one. Uh, and, and actually, the, the biggest advantage uh, of manufacturing uh, in China uh, was supply chain efficiencies and production scale. Which suggests to us that, again, with the right public policy, and, and given the fact that we have a really great innovation infrastructure in this country, uh, U.S.-based manufacturers, particularly for high-value-added manufacturing, uh, can still capture market share and, and do well in this market. Just to follow up on that, um, you is seen as a 
that's much more stable, much more strong than it was last year during the heart of the debates. While they're not very optimistic about their ability to sustain in the United States, um, there are lots and lots of opportunities for companies up and down the supply chain. We don't know that much about the supply chain. We're getting more information about the supply chain, but solar manufacturers anticipate increasing their workforce by about 8% next year. So that's pretty good. The national average is 15.6% manufacturers about 8%. I just add quickly, I agree with the, the comments of the other panelists, but I think it's probably a case where what's good for a car is not good for the whole generally in terms of the overarching what where we want the solar industry to grow. Um, and there has been a lot of focus on just the panel manufacturing component in particular, but there's a lot of other parts of the value uh, chain that we need to consider and a lot of the US has a leadership has a leadership role on uh, some of the films that go that have high IP value. People want to manufacture those in the US to protect that. We were a uh, leader hopefully we will maintain it countervailing tariffs around all the silicon. Uh, we have some unique uh, advantages in some of our manufacturing processes here in the U.S. So I think probably the, if you were asked me the best question, I agree that you know, try and pull back and also focus on what's been a low, bit of a low le level initiative in the past, but has increasingly focused now and try to work with the rest of the world to reduce uh, tariffs on environmental goods across the board because it is a public good to have uh, as much clean energy deployed as possible relative to what the world goals are on climate change and there's work in the WTO trade, trade organizations going on right now. Great. Um, okay, that's it. Thank you. <coughs> Patrick Haggis from Earth Day Network. My question is for Mr. Walsh. You said that your organization was working with a lot of teams to streamline the process of implementing solar panels um, across the country. I was just wondering if you could give any sort of examples of what they're doing to um, streamline that process. It's either specifics on cutting the red tape or reducing the cost. And then open up to the rest of the panel if you guys have any examples of what people can do at the local level to sort of streamline the, streamline the process and cut the costs for solar panels. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, 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 as I said, a lot of it uh, is uh, it, it's focused on standardizing and simplifying. One example would be actually work that we're doing uh, in, in the state that I mean, there's a lot about Washington State. Uh, it's called the Evergreen State Solar Partnership. Uh, and it's working specifically with the communities of Bellevue, Edmonds, uh, Helensburg, and Seattle. So uh, greater King County area in particular. Uh, in the past, every installation uh, of peak rooftop PV in those communities required a, a plan review, a building permit, an electrical permit, and an interconnection review. Right? That's a lot of permits and reviews. So the, the team we have been supporting there, this partnership, has uh, been able to review these processes, uh, align them, consolidate them, and streamline them uh, where they're not necessary. So um, that's just an example of kind of, you know, on the ground what a particular community uh, is doing. But at this point, we have examples across the country of, of 30 teams. Uh, and and you can, I can direct you to a lot more information on our website if that's interesting. I think we're done.
And one other thing I we just mentioned, my husband looked at an assessment of two state University of New York campuses uh, over the last couple of weeks in terms of programs that they have for installers, for solar. And he was struck by the fact that uh, not only were they really, really good training programs, but they have a hundred percent placement. And that they were saying that faculty was saying that frankly they're having trouble finding enough students to meet the demand for for uh, people going to these programs to be certified, which was a, was a very interesting and I thought exciting commentary uh, in New York State. Yeah. Actually I think that is exciting and that's one area of focus that might have been lost thus far in our industry and that is actually on the construction of the projects we spend so much time on the technology, the price points, how it fits together, and I, I would totally agree on the permitting and licensing, all, all those issues, those are huge headaches. That needs to get better. But basic construction knowledge in our industry, implementing things like lean initiatives and taking in a more thoughtful way the process of building solar wherever it is and really thinking about what is the optimal way to construct it. There's a huge amount of opportunity there to get done. And so some of it is the responsibility of companies like Sun Edison. And by the way, we have a team, a global lean team, that's devoted to that, which is lowering the cost in that part of it. And I think perhaps maybe there are other local alternatives as well. And I love the, the SUNY example there, um, because I would bet then that in the academic community, programs are very targeted around this, can be very effective. Because we need great folks all over the country to do that and do that well. Right. No, absolutely, absolutely. It's quite a story. Other questions? Back here. Hi. Um, I have a question about the projects. Our colleague from the German industry reminded me, I heard a lot of uh, abbreviations, but FIT, PM tariff. I didn't hear that mentioned. I know there's been talk about it for the last few years. The Europeans have used that with some degree of success. Um, does the panel have any thoughts on that? Uh, take a stab at that. I mean, we see a couple examples in states, but as a federal policy, probably given our very diverse uh, mix of utility companies in Germany, they have four to four utilities basically, so it's a lot easier to, to do and we don't see that on the federal level to, to implement in policy. Also given our you know, our electricity system is really a fifty state system with every state deciding on whatever electricity rules are they want. But it has been successful in Germany, although some uh, critics may argue it's a very expensive way to to get solar up to their high penetration rates, they pay a great deal of money for that. Some of that was their timing, it might have been cheaper now, but it was, uh, it was successful, but maybe not from some of the affordability metrics. Spanish also had them too, correct? They, they did, yeah. yeah. And on Chair, excuse me, on Chair just north of here, a very large program. I think one of the problems, and I know you alluded to it here, with the feed and tear programs is they start out so grand that unfortunately from an economic perspective they can be hard to maintain. And I think, you know, perhaps our German colleague could comment on this, but I think in Germany that was one of the issues. Um, and certainly in Ontario as well. So, um, but practically on the federal level, I don't think that's a reality here. There have been some state programs and more thoughtful, perhaps smaller and more ratable is workable. And the thing that is great is it's simple, right? But you ought to think long term as you design these, what's the sustainability of it? And the lessons haven't been great in many of the countries that have had the very grand ones. Yeah, I, I would only add that I, I, I think FIT is an interesting model. Let's not lose sight, though, of, of the fact that the primary demand driving policy mechanism at the state level is, is renewable portfolio standard, right? which um, now exists in 29 states. Some of them have solar carve-outs. Some of them have been under attack, uh, and so it's just worth noting that it, 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 in terms of, of an actual mechanism that is prevalent in this country, that's one to take less attention. I would agree uh, on the larger side, 
and perhaps on the smaller side as well. But the, uh, the net metering credits for some of the smaller systems, I think, is incredibly important here in the States. Very, very important. And so I think that's an area of definite emphasis and focus. Um, and obviously, there has been a huge emphasis with regard to tax policy in the U.S., but again, there are issues about how sustainable that is um, as well. And uh, in deference to our colleague from, from Germany, I, I must say that I, I think there's also been a lot of, um, uh, I mean, because I think the record is very, very impressive of what's happened in Germany, and we've had people from from the German government and from German uh, industry speak before, and that oftentimes people talk about, oh, costs um, in terms of electricity or the, the added cost was very, very great, and it's my understanding that it wasn't nearly as great as what a lot of people say it was, so that many times it's been kind of misrepresented. So, um, other questions? Sure. High prices for electricity in Germany, obviously highest in Europe, 28 cents a kilowatt hour, and the feed-in tariff is directly funded by the residential taxpayer, not industry. Industry is, every industry is largely exempt, so industry doesn't pay the, the feed-in tariff fees. We did start funding it at a very expensive time in 2001. We still have those legacy costs because we're paying 20 years of tariff. So we're still paying early on 25 cents, 28 cents per kilowatt hour. Now it's much lower at six cents. But we have a big political problem right now in Germany with electricity prices. And that's this new form of government in Germany is dealing with these issues for the low income ta uh, residential household who really can't afford some of the higher prices. Uh, it, Germany also has a higher tolerance for, for energy prices. Generally, the American residential payer wouldn't pay 28 cents. Uh, so it, we also have a different geopolitical situation with uh, as being a high energy importer. So it's hard to compare exactly. The U.S. is a much more natural resource rich country than Germany. And as Amy mentioned earlier, that in terms of when Germany started this whole thing, obviously costs were at a very, very, very different level. And it was, I think, Germany's policy had a lot to do with driving the cost down for the rest of us. Can I just mention sure. one point of that? Uh, you know, beyond the conversation we had, the important lesson, I think, for the U.S. from the Germany experience beyond the the cost and everything, but we're seeing that an advanced manufacturing economy with not very good resources, can they can accommodate very high penetration rates of solar. Uh, there's a lot of policymakers here in the U.S. who say there's no way we can get those percentages of solar uh, on our system. It would all break down. It's unreliable, things like that. So it's an interesting counter example that a lot of people are looking at how you guys made it work. <laughs> right. So we're looking there for lessons learned that can hopefully help us here, right? Uh, other questions or comments? Any last words from any of our panelists? Anything that you wanted to raise before the mics are turned off? Go ahead, mate. I'll say one thing, which is uh, with the policy discussion, you know, regardless of the policy itself, a lot it goes back to certainty. So the Phoenix tariff, the big strength is that it's the certainty that you're you're getting this fixed amount of electricity. Uh, fixed amount of payment over a long time period so you're able to go uh, ahead with financing with it's if it's the RPS you want to make sure that that's around so that you can you can uh, invest into that market and get the financing and it's the same now that we see in the uh, federal policies and investment tax credit and the makers the accelerated depreciation uh, that uncertainty is just is a real drag so whatever the policy is people just want the long-term ability to know what it's going to be and that is a good point on which to end because that's certainly something we've heard from business over and over and over regardless of the technology or application. So I want to thank you all very, very much for being here. Um, encourage you to go to the website uh, in terms of being able to look at the, the uh, state uh, by uh, state by state map and get all that information. And of course the video will be up on EESS EESI's website and connecting to the Solar Foundation as well. So thank you all for coming. Really, really appreciate it. And be sure and tell everybody um, about what is happening in the solar industry. Thanks.